Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our journey through Dietrich Bonhoeffer's masterpiece, Life Together. We're continuing to look at the first chapter of the book, which is called Community. And in just a few short pages, uh, Bonhoeffer uh, really covers a whole lot of territory. And uh, we're going to seek to to go over some more of the important concepts here today, and and continue to challenge ourselves to look at Christian community, and look at our neighbors, our sisters and brothers in Christ within Christian community, in a new and liberating way. And so, just a little review here of what we've been looking at. Uh, Life Together is Bonhoeffer's reflections about the experience of forming an intentional Christian community among the seminary students at Finkenwalde for two years. It was a unique opportunity for a unique situation in which uh, uh, the confessing church, which stood against the uh, Reichskirche in the 1930s and the Third Reich, um, did have the ability to form five seminaries to train those seminarians uh, um, there in Germany. And, and Bonhoeffer was called to be a director of one of them. And so the aim of writing this book was to give a, the church a picture of what Christian community can look like. And over those two years, Bonhoeffer tried many of the things uh, that gets described there in Life Together. and. Um, and he uses, and it particularly comes to us here in this chapter called Community, um, he is basing the planning and the execution of this Christian community on some foundational truths about how people relate to one another, have a common life with each other in, with, and through Jesus Christ. And so, so far, that was the point that really uh, hit home in those first few chapters of Life Together, uh, that Jesus Christ always is the center of Christian community. If Jesus is not at the center, it's maybe a community, but it's not a Christian community. And that unity is more than just who happens to be members of a congregation who happens to be gathered together for a worship service in some space or, or anything like that. This is a mystical unity that unites Christians throughout space and time among many denominations, many nationalities, many tribes and languages, as it is described so beautifully and poetically uh, in Revelation. It's Christ's gospel that then informs Christian community and its purpose, why it exists, and what is it called to do? And so we have to be grounded in the word and, and learning from Jesus uh, as we discover what it is we're to be about. And we've also began to uh, look into this idea that Jesus Christ is the mediator in all Christian relationships between an individ two individuals between a group of people, it is always through Christ. It is never on its own and never without Christ. Jesus himself manifests an agape, spiritual kind of love that is a gracious gift from God. And he manifests it so that we can, can learn from him, follow his example, and actually draw from Christ's presence among us in being able to reflect that kind of agape love that we would have with other people. It is only through Christ and through grace, which is God's love bestowed upon us, that makes this even possible. Now, of course, there is a, a physical element to Christian community. And, and so the, the physical gift which is so definitively given to us in the institution of the Lord's Supper, is that when we gather together around word and sacrament, we are physically here together in community. And of course, with word and sacrament being at the core, 
it is a physical giving of us of the body and blood of Christ in that bread and in that wine. So it is a, a physical reality as well. Then we ended last week by looking at these quotes from the middle of the chapter on community. And that is a warning against our thoughts and our minds longing for, seeking, and demanding some kind of ideal community that dwells really only in our minds. And here's a couple of good quotes for us to hear once again. Those who love their dream of a Christian community more than Christian community itself become destroyers of that Christian community, even though their personal attentions may ever be so honest, earnest, and sacrificial. God hates this wishful dreaming because it makes the dreamer proud and pretentious. Those who dream of this idealized community demand that it be fulfilled by God, by others, and by themselves. They enter the community of Christians with their demands. They set up their own law and they judge one another and even God accordingly. And so there is a problem with an ideal Christian community and it stems from the fact that it is a community grounded in the ego. It is a community grounded in the individual making demands on the others in the community and even demands in Christ himself. And so what is dangerous then about dwelling, uh, dwelling on and continuing to think about and imagining some ideal Christian community within us? If we find that our thoughts remain there, um, you know, it's just going to continue to spiral and roll over the course of weeks and months and years, um, leading to things that I think it relates very well uh, with the condition called acedia. And I define acedia in this way. It's a condition of sloth or boredom that moves a person to end up loathing self although they may not, not realize that. But in loathing self very quickly, we don't like to loathe ourselves. to loathe neighbors, others, to loathe the place where you are at, the commitments that you have made, and or the, the practices that you do, the things that you do, the things that you value. I mean, just about everything about you, you begin to loathe out of a place of, of boredom. No. And what it dangerously does is it leads a person to seek then other things, other persons, other places, not because that's what, what God's call is, but really in order to soothe that ego who does not like to be in a state where our mind goes into loathing ourself. This from Kathleen Norris's book, Acedia and Me, I think really pinpoints how Acedia is the, uh, the epidemic of modern life. She writes, I think it likely that much of the restless boredom, frantic escapism, commitment phobia, and in, in, innervating despair that plagues us today is the ancient demon of acedia in modern dress. And so when it comes to our churches and our church community, what that ends up doing is we bring those things into our idea, into our demand of Christian community, and we suddenly use the same techniques, the same sort of decision making that we use as, as regular American consumers into our idea of what it is we want, what it is we need, or even what it is we have to be in order to be Christian community. And um, and that's dangerous <laughs> because what we learn about God and we learn in scripture is that the value and power of the real is where it's at. <laughs> and wonder and glory 
is to be found in the now. But why treasure the here and now? Um, you know, I could be in Florida. I could be in Hawaii. I could be on a beach somewhere. Why treasure the here and now? I could be among other people who are just like me and are just as excited about Dietrich Bonhoeffer and, and know life together frontwards and backwards. Boy, wouldn't that be great if I was with them and I can learn from them and they can learn from me. What a great community that would be. So how is it I could treasure here and now where I'm with people who don't know life together, who don't understand Dietrich Bonhoeffer like I do, who do not see Christian community in this way? Why would I want to treasure this? Why value who I am today? You know, because, hey, I, I got faults and problems and, and things like that. Why treasure the people that you are with right now? Because, boy, when I take a look on social media, on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook, it sure does appear that there are a whole lot of other people and things that are having a whole lot more fun and to seem a whole lot more grounded than I am. These are the kinds of questions that uh, pop up in our minds <laughs> as we think about these things. And, uh, and, and the answer becomes this. And, and it is the definitive answer. It is where we find our hope. It is where we find our meaning and our clarity as we think about these things. Why treasure the here and now? Because God is here. Yes. Because God is now. Why value who you are? Because God values you. Because God loves you. Because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, became human and lived and taught and suffered and died and rose again for you. You, exactly as you are. And why is it you should value those who, who are with you now? Um, those who are in relationship with you now as your neighbors, as your family, as sisters and brothers in Christ in your church, because God loves them too, <laughs> just as they are. Because Jesus Christ died for them, just as they are. In the real, in who you are. And I, I put a picture here of a facade of people in masks. We don't know who they are. I guess it's four people there. And they have their, their, their pretty masks. Um, um, and, and that may be all fine and good. And, and we might, might want to make our, uh, uh, our masks. But, but there is a danger to living in the facades and seeking to live up to some sort of dream. And, uh, and really that, uh, that danger comes close to us and is revealed to us very well in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We've already learned in life together that it was a priority for Dietrich Bonhoeffer to use the Sermon on the Mount, which is three full chapters in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7. And after all the really thought-provoking, radical, bold, almost offensive teachings that Jesus gives to us in the Sermon on the Mount, he begins to sum it up by looking at, again, the way we live, the things we do, and he gives us a very interesting passage that comes to us in, in Matthew chapter 7 about our relationship with God being connected with the way we are and 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 the things that we do so jesus uh, now coming to the conclusion of the sermon on the mount says not everyone who says to me lord lord will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my father in heaven on that day many will say to me lord lord did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name, and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. 
Go away from me, you who behave lawlessly. I never knew you. Now, I think through the years, there's been ways this has been interpreted, you know, in, in, in a season in the church century ago where predestination was talked about a lot. You know, this could be an indication of predestination. Some people God, you know, includes in the kingdom of heaven. Some people don't. And no matter how hard you try, you are either not going to be included or you will be included. But it's not about that. It's not about that. It's about what is real, what is truth. It's about the dangers of the facades. It's about the dangers of the idea. And if we operate in such a way that we say, Lord, Lord, and we do the acts of being religious, being a church member, uh, being a, a believer of God in some phony way that represents somehow the phony demands of the culture, and not grounded in genuine truth of the gospel, the genuine truth of Jesus, the genuine truth of the love that we are called to, to inhabit and to reflect in the people we are, if we are not really being who we are, God's not going to know us. Jesus isn't going to know us. He doesn't know your facade. He doesn't know your ideal I, uh, in, vision of community. He doesn't know it because it doesn't exist. And God is a God of what exists. You exist. I exist. And God loves you and created you in God's image. It's you he wants. It's your heart he wants. It's you he knows. And it's you you can be. You belong to Christ in whom you have been baptized. And so be you and live in the name of the Lord as you participate in Christian community as you, because there is the real. And so Bonhoeffer is hitting this point in the real because, and, and think about this, in the 1930s in Germany, the only thing, the evil was always real. And, and the cynical, phony just language to, to connect anything to do with Jesus and the church with the with the programs that the Nazis instituted is 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 wicked and evil. It's not true. And so Bonhoeffer calls out his time and his people, but it, it continues to be a reality we need to be warned about and called out about as well. So let me put this back on here. I never knew you. So if you're living with the mask on, God doesn't know you, does not know your mask. God knows you. And so can we come to a point, though we are so influenced by the culture and by the, the measurements that the world places upon us, upon us as individuals, What's your credit score? You know, how, how, what were your grades in college? Do you have the right degrees? Do you do this? Do you do this? What, what's your income level and all that stuff? That's how the world measures you, but that's not how God measures you. And so there is a kingdom of God that is among us. It is in him that we live and move and have our being. And things are going on within Christian community all the time. You know, it's the title of a, Dietrich, of a, a Dallas Willard book, uh, The Divine Conspiracy. And it speaks to, again, the, the presence and the reality of, uh, of what God is up to, but it's not always noticed. And the results aren't always known. I mean, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was part of a conspiracy to, to uh, overthrow Hitler and the Nazis and the Third Reich. One could say that was a failure. Being part of a conspiracy meant that he didn't know everything that was going on. He had some role to play. He kind of knew his role and, and he did it to the best of his ability. And again, my, one might say that was a failure. Hitler was never assassinated until uh, you know the, the very bitter end of World War II. The Nazi government did not fall. And yet, and yet, 
through the actions of Bonhoeffer, through the actions of the conspirators, God worked through it. And though Bonhoeffer was executed uh, 79 years ago, his work and the seeds that were planted continued to produce fruit. The, the work of the kingdom continues to happen and in no worldly way that we would ever measure as a success. This is going on all of the time and it is going on in Christian community. So page 13 of Life Together, what may appear weak and insignificant to us may be great and glorious to God. The more thankfully we daily receive what is given to us, the more assuredly and consistently we will uh, um, consistently will community increase and grow from day to day as God pleases. Christian community is not an ideal we have to realize, but rather created by God in Christ in which we may participate. And so it is going on all of the time. And so if we can get out of our ideal thoughts of community, either um, through through the, uh, the nostalgia that we place on the way it used to be, or some idea that, that the excitement and growth that's certainly going out there must be going out there, that I don't see in me and in my community, um, get those out of our minds. And can we allow ourselves to participate in, with, and for community that you are a part of right now to have a role to play because Christian community is founded solely on Jesus Christ it is a spiritual and not an emotional reality in this respect it differs absolute from all other communities and at its core is love right <laughs> love what's the greatest commandments Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. But what is love, right? What is love? Well, Bonhoeffer makes a distinction between what is spiritual love and emotional love. Jesus himself manifests an agape, that's Greek word for love, an agape spiritual love, which always is seeking the good of the other, the good of the other. And Jesus commissions us to reflect that same spiritual love in all of our relationships. So that's the love of Christ. But what's this other kind of love? What's this emotional love? And so emotional love makes demands on the one being loved. Be this for me. Do this for me. Make me feel this way. It is love that is supposed to feed and soothe our own ego. All right. I remember when we were talking about acedia, um, when our ego, and ego is, is the self, us, that differentiates us from others. You know, this is how I am in comparison with other people. And when our ego is wounded, I'm not as good as other people. I don't measure up to other people. And so acedia will set in seeking, well, I need, I need to be with these other people. Or, or, or it's their fault. <laughs> if only I was in a better place or with better people, then I wouldn't feel so miserable. Uh, the, the movie, uh, Bill Murray movie from wow, now 25 years ago or so, What About Bob? I think ends up being a, a real classic um, description of, of emotional love as uh, Bob Wiley, the character by uh, Bill Murray, um, seeks the love and help and support of his psychiatrist, Dr. Uh, Leo Marvin played by Richard Dreyfus and in a great scene. He's, he's having a breakdown and he says, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. I need, I need, I need. <laughs> he wants, he needs Dr. Leo Marvin, uh, you know, in his sphere, uh, if he's going to find strength, you know. 
And so, you know, you might I asked the question, how much ideal community of our minds is related to emotional love? Almost all of it, right? Um, you know, I've, I've heard over the years, you know, and, uh, you know, when, when you know, a church, maybe there's a church service, there's 20 people, 30 people. And, uh, you know, oh, you know, to have a, a service where, where there's 100 people, you know, pastor, I just feel better. When there's more people in there, I I feel better when um, um, when when there's more people singing and, and all of that, and and that you know okay yeah I, yes all right and you 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 know what that feeling is, but is that looking at Christian community from a place of spiritual love, or is that looking at emotional community, uh, spirit uh, Christian community from a place of emotional love? And I'll let you uh, think about that. Here's a great quote from page 15 in Life Together, the chapter on community. And I and keep in mind the Lord's Prayer. And, and that, that classic way of putting this petition. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And don't think of trespasses as just sins, right? Think of it as a no trespassing sign, all right? <laughs> let's, let's think, like, just the way we think of trespass. No trespass, right? Within the spiritual community, there is never in any way whatsoever an immediate relationship with one another. Remember, uh, Christ is the mediator in all relationships. However, in the emotional community, there exists a profound elemental emotional desire for community, for in immediate contact with other human souls, just as in the flesh, there's a yearning for immediate union with other flesh, right? This desire of human soul seeks the complete intimate fusion of I and you. Now, now, now this is the sin of lust, but let's not just be thinking sex here. All right. It is the, you know, again, it's the gimme, 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 gimme. I need, I need. It is lust. I need you in my sphere. Okay. And don't, again, don't just think sex, sexual things. But again, that, that you are going to be exactly as I need you to be. That's going to make me feel better. That's what I need. Um, this desire of human soul seeks the complete intimate fusion of I and you, whether this occurs in the union of love or enforcing the other into one's own sphere of power and influence. You know, I already mentioned uh, Dallas Willard's book, uh, The Divine Conspiracy, which is now coming on uh, 30 years old. And um, in one of the concepts that Dallas Willard has just helped me so tremendously about is the concept of kingdom. What is the kingdom of God? The, the, the real presence of the kingdom of God, the availability of the kingdom of God, but, but even the concept of kingdom itself. Kingdom is your sphere of influence. And part of being created in the image of God is we've all been blessed with the kingdom. <laughs> you, you look behind me, here's a little bit of my kingdom, right? <laughs> On my books. And I... I get a little nervous if, if someone wants to borrow my books, you know, that's coming out of my sphere, my things, right? What if someone were to come in and not even ask and just, you know, take? Not only is that a sin of stealing, but someone has broken into my kingdom, is trespassing in my kingdom. And so the bottom line I want to make, we all have this. And, and the thing is, all human people in human relationship it's not only ourselves butting into one another, but our kingdoms. And, and, and it, 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 it gets tight, <laughs> you know, uh, and that's how we get, get anxious and uncomfortable. And, and you know, I, I want to increase my kingdom and my influence. And that's worldly stuff. It doesn't operate that way in uh, the kingdom of God. And so the beauty in, in, the, in the Lord's Prayer and the petition you know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
is this notion, not only that, you know, that I sin, but that my sin is, uh, uh, you know, uh, an imposition on somebody else, right? Or others are imposing on me, which is happening uh, all of the time. All right. And so we, we do need to be wrapping it up. What, what does this look like in Christian community? I don't know if you've ever been asked this question. It's not a question we typically ask as Lutherans, but, but, uh, but it's asked out there among Christians. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Right? And so emotional love will often come to look like within Christian community it becoming then a commitment, it demands a commitment of the other, um, a, a emotional conversion into Christian community. It demands again that commitment. And this is what Bonhoeffer writes. They thus show that their conversion was, was brought about not by the Holy Spirit, but by a human being. It is therefore not enduring. When Christian community and, and, and conversion is in the emotional realm, it is a human being, you know, selling you a bill of goods, you know, putting the pressure on you, like you like buying the car that you know someone else was looking at just a little bit of a little while ago. You better sign on the dotted line or putting in the offer on that house. You know, you know, you're getting receiving the sales pitch, and 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 either you're convinced because your arm's being twisted or you're convinced that this is going to make my life better. I'm going to feel better. I'm going to feel good about myself. I'm with such wonderful people. Look at the beauty of this place. Look at all these neat things going on. If the conversion is not out of the Holy Spirit, it is by a human being. And if it is by a human being, it is therefore not enduring. And so I want to leave us with this idea from page 18. This is the challenge of Christian community, and it is the challenge for each of us as followers of Jesus Christ. Can we look upon the other in this way? Only with Christ as our mediator, only by drawing from grace. Bonhoeffer writes, I must release others from all my attempts to control, coerce, and dominate them with my love. In their freedom from me, other persons want to be loved for who they are, as those for whom Christ became a human being, died and rose again, as those for whom Christ won the forgiveness of sins and prepared eternal life. I must allow them the freedom to be Christ's. I must allow my neighbor, my friend, my family members. I must allow those I sit with in the pew, those who I drink coffee with and coffee out. I must allow them to freedom to be who they are as they belong to Jesus Christ. Can I, in my freedom as well, participate within that community? Even, even as there's pressures being placed upon me. And so this is the challenge. And when it happens, just as we read from uh, Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in unity, or you should say, as brothers and sisters live together with Jesus Christ as Lord. And so for, uh, for next time, we're going to get into, uh, this will be the, the longest uh, reading assignment we're going to have. It's several pages, uh, 23 through 54 in this version of Life Together. It's the chapter on the day together. Don't get bogged down on it. Um, look at the bigger picture. Um, what Bonhoeffer is doing is he models the day their day together in this community upon the divine office or the prayer, praying the hours. 
morning prayer, midday prayer, evening prayer, Compline. And, and, and there is value in that, of having regular times that the community comes together in worship. Um, but it's also then the elements within worship that become central. And so notice how scripture reading together, praying the Psalms on a regular basis, singing hymns, intercessory prayer for others, breaking bread together, communion, yes, but just even having meals, confession, being vulnerable and being our true self. No facades now, right? I don't know you, Jesus says. I don't know who you are when you wear that mask. To have that ability for confession and then also, you know, that the, the, that work, labor is a part of the day as well. Take a look at that. We're, we'll talk more and, and kind of review um, this idea of spiritual love, emotional love. It's a very important concept to, to try to get at as we grow into this kind of community. But how are we blessed with different elements um, in our worship um, to, to be means through which grace comes to make things possible? So the day together will be uh, next week. It's a lot of good stuff here. There's so much good stuff. And I can't tell you, just for me personally, as a pastor, as a child of God, as a, a disciple of Jesus, as a brother in Christ to many sisters and brothers, just how gracious these ideas and these words and these teachings that Dietrich Bonhoeffer have been to me. It, it becomes a basis for, for living in the freedom to be just as you are. And to hear that gospel news that you are loved just as you are. So let, let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for your love and for the gift of Jesus, who, who is, of, co of course, the Son of God, your Son, who became man, human being, to be one with us, who taught us and modeled for us that agape love is possible and that your kingdom is ever among us. He suffered because we suffer. He died because we die. And he showed to us that death is not the end. It isn't the end. And so help us, O oh Lord, to live in your truth and your reality. May we be fully known to you, not afraid to be fully known, but to be honest and true. And may you bless us with a community, with sisters and brothers who will help support us and encourage us as, as we continue in this journey of being the kind of Christian community that is possible for us, all we need. In your name we pray, amen. So be at peace, Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.